Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Elise Adler, Director of Events for Parnassus Books. We are absolutely thrilled to share tonight's event with best-selling author and one of my favorite people, Lisa Scottolini. She's here to celebrate her new book, Eternal, which I want to say I just read, and it's amazing. And if you buy it from Parnassus Books, you will get it with a signed book plate. We'll go ahead and put the link in the Facebook comments for you. So hopefully you will purchase those. Lisa has agreed to take questions tonight. So ask them, be sure and ask some questions. You can put those in the Facebook comments as well. And I'm sure that Lisa will do her best to answer those questions throughout the course of the evening. We are especially excited because tonight, Lisa's in conversation with fellow best-selling author, Paula McLean. I am so pleased to turn it over to Lisa and Paula. Hello. Oh, we're Hello. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Here we are. Thank you so much for doing this, Paula. And thanks to everybody for being here. And thanks to Parnassus, one of the yeah, best Yeah, thank you, Parnassus. And congratulations, Lisa. Here's your launch date, which I, know. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't imagine that many people know how that feels for an author to see something that you've worked on for years and right. thought about and dreamed about right. and fretted over. It's right. Fun real and shareable with the world. So congratulations. I see your balloons in the background. I know I have such great girlfriends you celebrate. You know, it's really, it, people say, does, does it get old? And you know the answer, right? Of course not. I yeah, mean, no, it doesn't. And, and especially in these times, I feel, I'm like a count your blessings person anyway. So just to still be able to write 30 years in, 33 novels later and, have this job and have a life in books and get to meet you. We're girlfriends now. I know, yes, and find new ways to connect, to read right, and right. to other authors and booksellers. And I believe that books do really connect us. And so yes. congratulations. So I was lucky enough to get an early copy of this gorgeous novel. But most of the readers tuning in tonight will not have been so lucky. So why don't, without getting anything away, why don't you give us the sort of down and dirty plot summary of right. Eternal? What is this book about? Well, what it's about is a, it's a love triangle between a girl and two guys. They're three best friends. But what's different for me in any event is that it's set, well, not that I have a lot of love triangles in my life, like I haven't had a date in about like 25 years. Yes, what's different for me uh, is that it's set in fascist Italy. And it's set in fascist Italy. And it's sort of like, you feel like it's a little bit like life where you they don't know what is looming ahead of them. The modern reader will. And I sort of felt that Italy to a certain extent was the forgotten front. And I really wanted to explore the kind of the Italian Holocaust and fascism, how it led into that and how it was different from Nazism and how it impacted the lives of everyday people in Rome. So that's that's basically the headline. Right. So, I mean, it goes without saying that this is a dramatic departure for you as a writer and it's something very, very different kind of book than you've written before. So was that something that you knew was coming? Did it surprise you? Was there something about this story in particular that demanded to be told and that it didn't really matter what genre? So walk me through what that process was like for you. Right, well, it's, it's uh, to, to tell the short story, it started in college for me, which was like in the Jurassic, like, <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about 40 years ago. Like I'm old enough to be vaccinated. Let's put it that way. And, uh, <laughs> and I was lucky enough to take this course with Philip Roth at Penn. And it was a seminar, a year long seminar. And he introduced us to the works of Primo Levi, who was an Italian chemist who was swept up by the Nazis and taken to Auschwitz and survived to write the seminar memoir, uh, Survival in Auschwitz. And I was so, you know, you never really know. God bless teachers, because here I am all for these past 40 years. Because when I started to do the research, I sort of found out about this really kind of shocking, horrible, true event that happened right in Rome in October, 1943. And I also was a little bit like, why don't I know this? 
And I started to, you know, research it. And also, frankly, you know, she's not trying to, and we, I want to talk about your wonderful new book too, because it's a little bit like, is it a genre switch? How different is it and how similar? Because part of me says, yes, it has an historical aspect. And there are real victims in this. And I really had to do them justice. And it really required that type of research that was granular in many ways. Like, you know, what kind of bra would a young girl buy in 1930s Rome? That was actually fun research. I had to find a grandmother who remembered bras. You know, meanwhile, now we don't wear them, but uh, I bought one on for tonight. For tonight, I wore one. <laughs> hey, it's pub night, baby. Right. <laughs> but, um, so it's different in that respect, but the truth is, and I'm very lucky in the Count Your Blessings category to have readers who have come with me. I think I've been writing stories about family and justice and love for a long time. Right. So in a way, even though it's a little bit next level because it takes place in 20 years as opposed to three days. And I said to myself, you need to write historical fiction that will move at the pace of a thriller. Like that was my little job to myself. So that's what I hope I did, but that's all the stuff that went into it. I've been wanting to do it for 40 years. Yeah. So the research process, besides figuring out what kind of bra, Elisabetta, right, your main right. character, whom I, I just really love her so much. She feels Thank incredibly you. real to me. Um, and that's one of my favorite scenes, by the way. It's so, it's so, it comes to life. It just feels so human. It's such a human Thank moment. You. But did either the research piece or the writing piece feel new to you? Did it feel different? Was your process different? Did you come at it in a different way? Were there more surprises? Did you outline it differently? Or I would just love, this is just something I would like to know. No, and I would love to know that from you as well. I, I didn't outline, I don't outline anything. Like I'm divorced twice for a reason. Like I don't, I'm not a big, let's think about this. Slow your roll, Scottolini. Like I usually like, ah. So that's kind of how I approach everything. Um, I think I I must tell you, and the honest answer to your question is that I was had more insecurity than usual, which for me is like a lot of insecurity because I was like, this is kind of different. Is it different? Is it not different? And can you do it? And it was interesting because I think so many novels are about identity. In fact, I think your novel, When the Stars Go Dark, coming out next month on the 13th is about identity too. And Eternal is about the identity of these characters and also of their parents. You know, one, one joins fascism. Like he goes, am I a fascist? Am I my uniform? Who am I? And I started to think about how that's a question. There's a lot of reasons this book is titled Eternal. And one is that that's an eternal question. Mm -hmm. And I had it myself when I was writing this. Because am I a thriller writer? What is that? Am I a domestic thriller writer, a legal thriller? So I just said to myself, I just think, maybe you feel this way too, Paula, but I'm just a lady in the suburbs who wants to tell these stories. And mm -hmm. this story deserved to be told. And I must tell you, you may, maybe you relate to this too, but all this time since I found out about it, I said, Lisa, soon, someone's going to tell that story and you're going to get done out of it. And take it from you, right? Right, and it's your story and you know you're so ready. And all these years I've been researching and I said, to myself, finally, don't be afraid. Like just really, really try. You're a, you can change who you are and what you want. So yeah. write an epic if you want to try to write an epic and that's eternal. Exactly, that there's really no one there to green light us except ourselves. And when we take those risks and when we challenge ourselves at those levels, I believe that the rewards can be greater. Right. right. I certainly emotionally. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. important as an, let me take a second too, to mention your books because I have loved Paris wife and love and real. I'm a huge Thank fan. You. Of your own. Thank you but, so much. But I do think it's, let's take a second because in a way we did a genre swap. You are. Yes. Why don't you elaborate? It is, we did. Thank you. Around. And can I hold your pretty? Yes. Here. Yes. Um, Yes. And in fact, we did an event together a few months ago that was called Genre Swap, and we did it for libraries. And we had this conversation, which was so rich and so interesting to me and felt so validating to talk to somebody who had also gone through those same things. I would like to say that I had utter confidence. Genre, schmanra, who cares? I know I write about people. And yet the um, fraud anxiety, right? Those voices in the night, like, can I really do this? Do I right. have chops? Right. So do I, what do I know about suspense? 
right? I mean, yeah. but you well, wrote a very special novel. And, and yet there are through lines in my book to all the work that I've done. And there are through lines in this book that make it recognizable as something you've written. And I just want to congratulate you for having the the chutzpah, you know, for having the brave heart to write the book of your heart and that you had been thinking about because what are you waiting for, right? Exactly. Like, well, you're so, kind, always now. you're so kind to say that. And the truth is for people who love to read like we do and for people out there who want to write too. I really don't believe any writing is wasted. I kind of feel like I've been practicing my whole life to write this book. And when you read like your book, which as you say, you're a historical, historical fiction author writing suspense and when the stars go dark, I saw elements of history in that. There was real true life American crime history that I remember and you wove those in, correct? Correct, correct. And correct. so in a way you bring all of those chops all the time to everything you're writing. Thank you. I think we are ourselves as writers regardless of what we turn to as subject matter. And yet when we do turn to something that is that feels new or the process feels new, I think it can grow us as writers. And I believe that with this book, you have grown. I, I, think, it's, I think it's really beautiful and wrenching and that you're taking a really big bite of history. So I wanna talk about that for just a minute because of course, for anyone who reads, there are a lot of books about World War II, but it does feel like you're telling a slightly new piece of that. So talk about that a little bit and why this is a story not typically known when you said you took the course with Prima Levy, you didn't know about this history too. So right. why is it, where is it gone? Like, how has it been occluded or hidden or... I think it's so interesting because when I started to do the research and I, you know, read everything and watched all the movies and read a lot of fiction of the time and met historians and worked with them. And one said, to, I, when I found this event that happened, which was kind of a, a war, it was a war crime. And I said, why was there no trial about this? Because I used to be a lawyer. I admit that as much as I want people to like me, you know, and I go, well, <laughs> what, um, why was there no Nuremberg for this? And he said to me, an expert, nobody wanted another Nuremberg. And as soon as he said that, I was like, I do. Like, that's an injustice. And when I started to look at fascism, I think you're right, and I love World War II books, but very few talk about Italy. And fascism is really interesting. And especially with respect to what was the lead up to World, uh, War, II. World War II. Yeah, because fascism, Mussolini invented fascism. And there's so many unique things about Rome. For example, we all know that Rome is the seat of Roman Catholicism, but I did not realize that it was also home to the oldest continuously existing Jewish community in Western civilization. Like what? And I have been there. I mean, I, I've gone to the ghetto as it's called, I've eaten the artichokes. I was taken there by an Italian publisher. None of this was mentioned. And the more I learned about it, it demanded to be told. And what's interesting, especially poignant about the times that I think folds into the novel too, is that the Jews of the time joined the fascist party for the reasons people joined fascism. And you get to ask yourself, what makes somebody join that party? Well, this great belief in ultranationalism, you know, Mussolini said, you are Italian and that's very special. Rome conquered the world and you are Roman. And also the law and order stuff, the big business stuff. And when Jews joined the fascist party, there was no anti-Semitism in fascism in the beginning. So mm -hmm. they were lulled into believing they would be safe when, right. when Nazism rose. Just sort of tucked inside. Exactly. The other message and that maybe even some of the supporters of fascism, these nationalistic voices, didn't know that this was hidden inside and that also meant anti-Semitism. So right. when you went back, because I know you went back to right. the Jewish ghetto in Rome, how did that feel to be there walking inside history, knowing what you'd learned because you'd started out? Exactly. And the coolest thing was I made a point of going in October. 
So I went for the details of what is the light like? Like that's the kind of stuff we love that make it really course, feel real. Yeah. What's the dust on the cobblestones? What does it smell cold? like? The yeah. smell, is it warm or cold? And it's good to know because I went with all these sweaters and I was running around in tank tops. But, <laughs> but what was really important is that it happened to be, well, I planned it, but I got lucky, was the 75th anniversary of this horrific event. And so I went to these memorials and the victims were, of course, have sadly passed. Amaz of course, the Nazis who did this passed. And as a lawyer, I go, well, how do you get justice then? And the only justice you get is to tell the story. And so when I was there, I talked to people. You know, they're super nice. So I'm, I'm writing about this. I want to do it justice. What do you know about it? What can you tell me about it? Mm -hmm. And it also just imbued me with the gravity of it. And also at the same time, that's the whole issue with any kind of you have murders in, in when the stars go dark and you have to make it personal rather than just a number or the fourth victim or the six millionth victim the, the, or the thousandth victim. You have to make it one. It has, to be, in, it has it. to be intimate. We need to know who these people are inside right. and out. And I love what you just said about the all you can do to seek justice at that point is to tell the story, to continue to tell right. the story. And it makes a lot of sense then to me that your character, Elisabetta, you know, is a writer. She's a writer in sort of the truest sense. She needs to write in order to feel like herself. It's her, her best thing. And you have her discovering in the end that it's her, it's her duty to tell this story. It's right. her gift. And it's a kind of grace in order to be able to live through something and then tell the story to others so it never gets lost. So right. it's beautifully done. And so tell me, tell me about your connection both to Elisabetta or if there's a favorite character of yours in the novel that kind of grew out of just something you deeply wanted to say or well, explore. I think it's that what was challenging about this is normally I'll tell a story about a single family. And this was a story about three families and generations within those families. It's, it's not that hard to keep track of, but it was a bigger in scope. And so I thought of it, it was strange. I, re I remember being in Rome and they, um, they served me this pizza. This is an aside, but it actually mattered. <laughs> I ate this pizza and this pizza was so good that I actually cried. I grabbed the waiter crying, going, this is so good. You know, if you're watching the Stanley Tucci thing, it was that kind of, oh my God. And when I was looking around too at the, the architecture of Rome and I saw the different layers, some from ancient Rome, some from the 1800s. And of course, being Italian and also not having a lot of space, they're not gonna erase anything. They lay it on top of each other. And I thought of the word palimpsest, you know, that idea that an old medieval manuscript you know, there's writing underneath, but when they wipe it away, it never really goes away. It's the layers of time made visible. And I was eating that pizza and I was thinking, that's like a family. A generation is the layers of time made visible. So mm -hmm. when you look at the palimpsest of Rome, it's not just the architecture. It's the families and the stories of the families become the whole and they last eternally. And you start to think about time as you do in your novel. What is, is you know, past is not even past as Faulkner said, but then you get to the point where it's conflated so that you go, well, the person who says I'm becoming my mother, I started to think just from writing this, I already am. I am my mother, I am my daughter. We all contain those multitudes and you really have a, a more vast view. And with regard to Elisabetta, I really wanted to make the point a little, I'm gonna quote uh, Dante badly. That's my favorite thing, <laughs> butchering <laughs> the geniuses. And he, he said something like, there's no greater sorrow than in hard times to remember happiness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, right, like that really applies here because the beginning of this book, we're talking about the hardship that occurs later, but the beginning there's pasta and there's wine and there's music and there's love. And there's all the stuff that makes Italy so like why you wanna go there. I know, I know. Right? I know. And, and so let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about love because when we met before and did the event about swapping genres with each other, um, we were both, sort of laughing at how 
romantic love has not been a great success for either of us, right? I mean, I've been divorced twice and you were, you know, you always laugh about your ex-husband and all that stuff. And I just wonder, I really wonder, because I think it's sort of astonishing that in this book, you tell a love story sort of that is, there's nothing ironic about it. This is big love. This is huge love, right? Elisabetta and Sandro and Marco, they're, they're sort of all wrapped up in this and it's, it's all encompassing, right? Oh, that's very kind that. of Did you? I know. It was so fun to think about that and be swept away, you know, pretend you're her and swept away by two guys. And, and it's a little bit no win because it's not the typical love triangle and just the guys hate each other and they fight over her like a ram or something stupid they're like that. They're more like brothers. They love yeah, exactly. They, it's, so it's hard to see how they win. And I wanted the reader to worry about that. And since I'm a person who doesn't know the ending, you know, they go, do you know how it ends? I don't even know how it middles. Um, I, I'm like, oh, geez, who's she going to choose? And I think the key thing that you were talking about is, you know, the authenticity that there has to be for it to have a timelessness, which is really what I was going for, believe it or not. I wanted it to be a big love that is real. And, and I remember, and also a little bit the time when that, when I don't want to say young love, because I think it happened anyway. I mean, I had a date like a well, while I had a date a long time ago. But I remember when I had it, I kind of got, it was crushy. And it was like, I was waiting for the phone to, I was doing all that. It becomes sweet. How your emotionality, because it's a culture, Italy, that allows that emotionality and gives it great permission. And so I wanted her to feel that. And also the contrast later, the same with the food. They, there's so much food and abundance and love and all that, the stuff of life. And as it starts to dissipate, as the war comes on and the Jews become oppressed, and then there is war and rationing of food, and then Italy is bombed in the South so that there's no wheat to make pasta. Okay. And the Nazis weaponize food against the Jews, trying intentionally to starve them to death. Um, uh, you, can't, you can't appreciate the cruelty and the drama and the truth of that unless you have experienced how and wonderful we had this which goes back to your quote about exactly sorrow of this happiness as it seems right. to me too that there's something about young love and it doesn't have to be young but young at heart maybe new, maybe new that love really opens you up so that all of your nerves are exposed and all of life feels more available and you feel more permeable and it seems to me that these characters are very permeable to their surroundings, to everything that's happening in their lives, which, which is so rich. Right. It's the beginning. It's a very, very rich beginning. And then we see them, um, we see them come into knowledge. It's like the innocence to experience. Passage. Right. And for the city of Rome as well, which is an eternal city, which has been around you know, it's, it's an ancient city. And so it's lived through wars and it's lived through loves and right. The palimpsest is there. And yet right. for these characters, this is their crucible. This is and, it, and it's interesting too, when you look at the, 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 the older generation in the book, the fathers, you know, there's uh, Sandro's father who's Jewish. He's a fascist. He's a lawyer. And as he undergoes what the barrage of fascist laws, which you learn about in the book, and it was, it's like death by a thousand cuts. You know, first they took your property, then your house, then your profession, then your fascist party membership, and then your Italian citizenship. Wow. So he gets down to, you know, that question of that that feeling you get from new love that we're talking about yeah. um, is a feeling that I think you get from anything new. I must tell you, as weird as that is, I feel that way with this book. Today was really, this is a new thing. And I read all the reviews and I read the reader quotes and I am uh, more jazzed. And, and that's, well, as you say, that's why you do it because you grow. I think readers feel that. And I love them for their loyalty. They followed me book to book. And I think they will come to this too, I hope. And I think they will find the next level that they want to. Yeah. And, and you know, this idea that we are opened up by with things that bring us to life, right? And to then to pay attention to those things and to move toward those things. Right. Right. That's a perfect turn of phrase. Life. The mm -hmm. things that bring us to life. 
Yeah. That's it. And especially now, it's so wonderful to be able to connect in these ways and this kind of discussion. And I hope people are enjoying it too. And I'd love to hear the questions, you know, yeah, this brings absolutely. it to life. We're still absolutely. in touch with each other. Yeah. Um, so just a few more questions and then we'll sort of open it up to your, to your readers, your very loyal fans, the bajillions of them. What you said earlier about family and, and that this is something that's a through line in your work, a thematic through line and something that you're always interested in. Here, when we have these three families, it seems to me the easiest thing to have done would be to make some of these families um, wrong, right? Or to have there be easy villains or people, do you know what I mean? We have these sets of parents and, and the decisions and the choices they make influence their children. And there are secrets that have been kept, et cetera. But it seems to me that there's a very mature way that you deal with the complexity of family and that there isn't an easy judgment against some of these decisions because of course, we're all doing the best with what we have. So anything else that you want to say about the families at the, the center of this book, ways they surprised you or bits of their stories that crept in that reminded you of your own family? Oh, um, I think, you know, it's interesting. Elizabeth Betta's family is, you know, she's kind of an alcoholic father and a mother who is not attentive. And Marco has a tight-knit family and an oppressive father. And the truth is I didn't plan any of it. Sandra probably has the most, quote, functional family, but they have issues too. And it's funny when I was writing it, I, I sort of thought, gee, you know, you're the rookie, his fic author. Are you allowed to do this? Like, and then I said, well, there's still people. People have always been people. That's right. And, you know, and, and that's something you really want to just mine that, just go there with it. Um, and I was happy to, to be able to do that. I mean, that was kind of cool. Um, I forgot the other thing I was going to say. When I was gonna... <laughs> I'm sure it was incredibly pithy. I'm sure it was incredibly wow. <laughs> So I will say quickly that I was looking for- Oh, wait, I do know. I do know. Oh, okay. But it doesn't matter. Well, no. the only headline is that Elizabeth looks for a, ha ends up having a mother's substitute because her mother is not very good in a woman who's a lot like my mom. And a very kind of, and it's when you talk about, that's when I had the insight when I was writing us, this character, Nona, who, who teaches Elisabetta her craft of making pasta is taken directly from my childhood. And we even put the rest, of, oh, the website will have all this stuff up, but we even put that stuff up there. That's what I was going to say. The yeah. food to me feels incredibly personal and that that personal. just feels like it grows out of your own love and the way love and food are wrapped up in family and that we cook for those we love and that we teach those we love to cook and it's the way that we connect yes exactly. exactly and i loved the character of nona and i loved elizabetta i loved her cat i loved the whole thing oh, the cat is good. <laughs> thank you um okay so we're going to do a quick thing as we wrap up i thought this might be um kind of fun and because i know your game and you are fun to do like a quick lightning round that should take like two minutes and Let's then we're going to open it up to the questions from your readers so this would be the moment that if you were going to those who are in charge we're going to load uh the questions into the chat that would be great okay ready yes but this is a lightning round, so don't think about it. I won't. I don't never think about it. Talk. It's great. Okay. Something on your writing desk that's important to you. Gum. Mentos gum. <laughs> okay. A writer or book that inspired you as a child? Anything but with Nancy Drew. Oh, yeah. Same, 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 same. Okay. The novel of yours that was the toughest for you to write? This one. No doubt. No doubt. Really? Okay. Do you write on a computer or longhand? On a computer. Yeah, same. Coffee or tea? It, Dunkin' Donuts, extra cream, extra sugar, large. <laughs> I, I can't write without it. I can't do anything without it. How red about wine, you? Red wine or white wine? Red. Yeah, okay. Do you listen to music or do you need it to be silent? I have television on constantly, like, in, like a freak. Even when you're working? All the time. TV's my oh, friend. Wow. TV's actually That's my crazy. only... It's the longest marriage I've had, me and my television. It's That's crazy. <laughs> okay. What's more important, plot or character? Character. Yeah. Um, do you ever dream about the people in your books? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Favorite thing about being a writer? That you get, it's embarrassing, that you get love and you get to give love, the connection with readers. I love that. I love that. I love that my world is expanded. Yeah, I'm very clear <laughs> to you include know. the people who yes. read me. Like I know them, I know their children. I watch them get grow up. Mm -hmm. That's just an amazing. That's like there's not right. There's not a lot of jobs, Paula. Yeah, there's not a lot of jobs that that, do that. that come with that level of yeah. You're absolutely right. And the connection yeah. begins with the book. That's why bookstores matter so, and libraries matter so much. You yeah, you open your soul to each other. Yeah. Okay. One writing habit of yours that you would change if you could? I, I don't know. I, no bad habits? Well, I, I'm a very bad typist. I, I wish I were a better typist. I'm a very, and I don't want to learn it. And I've written so many, and sometimes <laughs> I stump spell check and then I have to go back and it takes so long. Yes, I wish I knew how to type, but I don't care enough to learn. Okay. How do you sell? Wait, what's yours? I want to know. Don't stop. It's Tell yours. Me. You're the star. You're the bride. Two more. How do you celebrate finishing a novel? Uh, I don't really. I just feel so happy in my heart that, you know, I first draft is such, you know, Hemingway says, write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> and, and since I don't know what I'm going to, where this story is going to go, I'm like in a total state of panic and anxiety in all first draft. So my happiness comes not even when the book's finished, when first draft is done. It's like, yeah. oh my God, how do you like that? Yeah. Okay. Last question. Yeah. Best advice you ever got about writing? Anne Lamott, and I, I, give yourself permission to write a ready for profanity, shitty first draft. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good advice, isn't it? Yeah, no. least we get in our own way. We get paralyzed. Oh my God, it's not good. Philip Roth was, who also was said in an interview once, um, don't judge it. It is not for you to judge it. You can't write it if you're also judging it. That's true. Exactly. They're two different idea. hats. And if we become too perfectionistic, then we shut it down before it's ever, before it ever comes to life. You're exactly. Trying to, mm -hmm. exactly. You're trying to bring something to life. And so how do we do that, right? Right. We're kind, we're kind, we're open, we forgive ourselves when we make mistakes, or that's the idea. So I see a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to see if I can do this. Oh, but you're doing so great. I, well, I don't great. know. I don't know. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. This is hard for authors. Okay. So this <laughs> is from this is from Sonia Williams Mallory. And the question is: what inspires you or brings your creativity on? Besides the Dunkin' Donuts coffee? Besides Dunkin' Donuts. I feel lucky. I feel very, very lucky and blessed all the time in, in being able to do this and being able to like, here's a story that's been bothering me, percolating. It's my personal thing. I think it needs to be told. Um, I get to do that. And every day, all I have to do is get up and tell that story. And I do it seven days a week. And I, I, I never feel like I need a vacation or a break or... I'm, I just feel this is so great. I just feel yeah. really, really lucky. No. Okay. So here's a good one. Okay. This is from Kelly O'Donnell Helduser. Sorry if I'm just um, butchering your names. And she says when she writes about in a book, writes her characters that sometimes when she's finished with the book, she misses them as if it's a friend that's gone away. And so the question is, do you miss your characters? When All the time. Writing? Yeah. Because it's, do, do you? Oh, Yeah. Yeah, oh, I, I do. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> I you think know, it's like it's like a funeral, you know, or like a divorce. And then, you know, it's time to move on, but you're not ready to move on. When you get to keep them there. inside. And that's why, you know, I feel this is another reason I'm lucky because I wrote Rosado and Associates was a series. And I I'm going to return to that. And that was really a great thing. It's like seeing an old friend. These characters, you know, there's a point when you're writing. Tell me if this happens for you when you you wake up thinking about them. You go to sleep thinking about. You do dream yeah. about them. And just to live in this world of mm -hmm. Rome and this food and the art and the music and the the emotionality and the drama, I felt swept away. And I felt I, I'm embarrassed to admit that I listened to the audio book of my own book today in the car. <laughs> I've never done it before, and I was like, I love these readers. I want to listen to this. And I'm like, mm. ah, you know, you just get. 
that's what a book should do, transport you. And especially Amazing. now, especially now we need it more than ever. Okay. This is from Barbara Berry. And she says, when you're in the zone and writing well, do your characters just pop into your head and start talking? Do you ever visualize them, their faces, their, you know, their physical selves? Um, oh, there's a whole bunch of other questions, but we'll start with that. Yes. Right? yes, talk yes, to you, yes. Can you see them? Yes, of course you have to. You, you. Stephen King was the one who said you imagine the scene and then you reproduce it for the reader. And I think that, and, I, and sometimes I'll just let them talk, and see where it's going. Do you do you do that as well? I do. When it's working well, then it flows. You're in a scene and you know what your character is going to say to each other as you're doing it, and you're sort of moving so fast. That's the that's when it works, right? That you're. If you type fast, <laughs> I know. <laughs> then you can circumvent your rational mind and just write from that deep place where it feels like your characters are talking to each other and that you're not in the way at all and you have no agenda that they have lives. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I'm sure everybody can do that. You can any normal person can imagine, like for example, I can tell, imagine the way my mother would tell a story. That's very much like what we do, I think. Like, I have a character in mind. This is the way they behave. And so I just channel that person. Yeah, absolutely. It's like how it's not like magic. Anybody can do it. An actor and having this character exactly a role, and you're speaking with their voice and you're uh, moving right. with their right with their form. And it is, it's it's sort of magic too, because then yes. the reader can imagine those too. Exactly. So um everybody loves this question. If you had to cast this book for a movie, who would you cast? You know, who could play Elizabetta or the beautiful Marco? You know. This is the, I don't want to bring everybody down. I'm happy that they asked this. Thank you for being here and being terrific. But the truth is, I never think about that. And I feel like it's a little jinxy because I'm a book person. And so are you, look behind you. You know, I love that. I know exactly what Marco looks like. He's so gorgeous and beautiful and magnetic. Like the book says, he has sprezzatura. You know, I, I wanted to, I, there's no translation for that. It means like an effortless sexual magnetism, charisma. And, but my image of him, I don't want to put a face on that. I want the reader to have an image of him that is equally valid. Because I think when readers bring their imagination to it, that's when they open their own soul up to the book. Right. So it's not the same as a movie. Yeah. yeah he's going to tell you what he looks like, but a, but a book, and that's why I think you can't let it go because I know what he looks like. And I remember, and I wish I want to be back in his world again. I just want to be in yeah. his presence again. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. There's that, Thank it you. is a kind of magic and we do it from the time we're children, right? Right. We're swept away and transported in these characters become our friends, you know? Right, exactly. Um, so this is from Angela Leterio Hastings. Sorry if I butchered your name. When writing Eternal, did you find it hard to take the facts and weave them into your fiction story that you wanted to tell? I, that's an excellent question. And the answer is yes. Here's the key thing about writing, at least for me, it's hard. Everything is hard. Nothing is easy about it. You don't have to dig a ditch. So it's better than, but it's, so I just said to myself, the story has to lead. And that's been true in any kind of novel. You probably found that in, in writing suspense. You know, you're writing, and you have a lot of history in that. Personal history of the character that is backstory and also history of true crime that occurred in California. And I had history of the characters I had you know, gee, no one's going to know about this fascist stuff. How do, you, how do you get that in, in a way that is natural? And I just said, that's why I think I steeped myself in it for so long and then said, now start writing. And then the stuff that came was the only stuff that was necessary. So it's not studying. It's, it's really going to sweep you away. And one of the reader's reviews said in Goodreads, like it was, it's like 450 pages, but they couldn't put it down. And I was like, yes, you know, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. And that's the answer to that is pacing. If you can't do it in the first draft, you do it on the edit, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that feeling that it's all natural, that it really is, it's stitched in, you know, it's stitched into the, right. the fabric of the story so that right. all of these decisions feel completely natural. Okay, two more. 
from Claria. No, I can't even say this right. Claria Benigno. Mm, oh, do you have I know another, her. Do you <laughs> know her? Do you I have another know. epic waiting inside ready to come out? Yes, I do. If so, what is it? I Tell can't us. talk about it yet. I haven't even told my editor, but I've loved doing this. Okay. I've, lo I've loved this. Really? So yeah. will you say just two more words about um, that? Just about you've loved doing this. You've loved steeping yourself in history and being taken over by the engine of history. So maybe something in that and, realm. And it did surprise me how much, you know, the timelessness of it, you know, that's sort of the cliche that history repeats itself, but that that history enlightens us. And that the more I learned about it, you know, there's little nuggets in here. There were, for example, there was a Monsignor at the Vatican who hid Jews in the Vatican. And then at the end became friends with the Nazi and converted him to Catholic. I mean, there's so many little nuggets of little stories. And I was just loved, and I love that they're in the world now. And that's, that's really how I feel that this book's coming out. So thank you for that. So last question, and this is from the author, Martha Hall Kelly. Oh my God, oh my God. Another author I love. Oh my God, her son. Absolutely so amazing. Yeah. So Lilac Girls, if everyone. Lilac Girls, knows. exactly, yeah. Um, okay, last question. Eternal is so- And Lost Roses too, which yes, is so I know. wonderful. This is so great, because this is like harmonic convergence of my two favorite authors, Paula and Martha Hall Kelly. How great. So fun, okay. Eternal is so full of delicious Italian food. Did you use all your favorite recipes that you personally like to cook? No, I didn't use them all. Maybe they will come back in the next historical fiction. But thank you. Thank you so much for that question. It's fun. I think the food really does come to life. I was hungry when I was reading the book. And it's that's just a, another way to convey just the 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 richness of of rome as a yes place. well nona says in it that to eat her food is to know who she is mm -hmm. and a little bit i feel that way about our books you know and 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 that's true of martha hall kelly as well that you know barbara king solver said once you know if to know me read me and mm -hmm. i think if you're writing with an authentic voice and i think all three of us do you know if people have read us and they meet us, they're not really all that surprised. I mean, we're kind of like what we write, which is sort of some amazing alchemy because we're not writing about ourselves per se. And I do want to take a minute to talk about when the stars go down. Oh, April 13th, you. I loved this. As thank we said, you went so historical fiction to suspense. And it's the story of Detective Anna Hart, who's going to go back to her hometown. And there is a girl missing. And it's that's the, only the top line plot. Because what's so, this book has such depth and so many layers yeah. because she really ends up, well, maybe you, you tell it. Well, I'm not going to tell it. I know you don't want to, but then right. I'm going to end up. You're the down. star and you're the bride, but thank you so much for supporting. I loved the novel. As my I love work Sunflower. and my book and congratulations to you, Lisa. I think this is a tremendous accomplishment and I just uh. want to say thank you for sharing so much of yourself with us tonight and thank you for writing this glorious book eternal on sale today people and thank That's you so blood. much for absolutely doing lisa and i'll see you in the world on the road one day if the gods are kind yes yes and thank you everybody for coming and thanks to parnassus for thanks having us parnassus all. absolutely so good night everyone thank you so much bye thank you again paula bye